Dan susulan PKP penuh yang diumum dan laporan yang kami bawakan sebentar tadi, ramai pihak yang suarakan keperluan bantuan dan sokongan daripada kerajaan untuk orang ramai dan perniagaan yang terkesan. Menurut pengasas bersama Skelab Malaysia, Aaron Sarma dalam kemas kini media sosialnya pada 28 Mei lepas ketika penutupan penuh ini, sokongan perlu diberikan kepada perniagaan kecil dan kumpulan yang pendapatan mereka terkesan. Aaron turut menggesa moratorium diberikan dan menyatakan yang bank akan dapat harungi tempoh ini. Dalam kemas kini berkenaan, beliau turut menyertakan laporan berita yang menunjukkan bank di Malaysia mencatatkan keuntungan pada suku pertama tahun ini. Dan kita ingin membincangkan berkenaan bantuan moratorium yang diperlukan orang ramai dan perniagaan bersama dengan Aaron Sarma, pengasas bersama Scale Up Malaysia. Izinkan saya meneruskan dalam bahasa Inggeris. Aaron, after two days, we still haven't heard from the government as to the assistance that it will provide um, for the uh, B40s, M40s and the SMEs. We're just one day away from the full lockdown. Your thoughts, Aaron? Hey, good morning, Reza. Well, here we are again. Uh, at, uh, another lockdown is coming. And um, I, I think it's, it was really interesting when, when the lockdown was, was announced. Uh, last, the week before this weekend, we had a three-day cliffhanger where you know we were waiting for uh, a new lockdown to be announced and it ended up just being an extension of time. Uh, and then out of nowhere last weekend, they announced a, a full lockdown. And of course, uh, the next thing everybody asked for were the SOPs. And of course, after that, the next thing people ask for is, okay, what does this mean? Because we've been here before, guys. We've had a situation where we started with a two-week lockdown, and last year it ended up being several months. So I think that's the, the real concern a lot of people are having is that, okay, we're all for this. We understand that the lockdown is essential. We need to do something to kind of curb the, the number of cases coming because ultimately, uh, you know, we can't have an economy if everyone is sick. So we have, we have to do this. Everybody understands this. But as you mentioned in the introduction, we also kind of highlighted that ultimately people are going to get affected by a lockdown, especially if it's prolonged more than the two weeks and it goes on for an indefinite period, uh, especially those in the M40, B40 communities and definitely SMEs. Uh, I think that's really important because SMEs are the backbone of the Malaysian economy. It hires 66% of Mal Malaysian workers are hired through SMEs and it represents a large chunk. It's like almost 98% of all businesses are SME businesses. So it's really important that mm -hmm. we address this because these SMEs, most of them are in the services sector. Uh, they're going to have the income adversely impacted, which are then going to impact workers. That's going to dove dovetail into our economy as well. So we, we need to do something to help people who are going to have the incomes impacted by the lockdown. Now, this delay uh, in announcing the measures to support the uh, rakyat and also the PK, uh, the SMEs out there, uh, how will this affect consumer and business confidence? Uh, I mean, greatly, right? Because the second, I mean, I, I, at this point, we've, been, we've done this for more than a year now. So the expectation that I would have had is that we, we announce these lockdowns with like a, a, a three-point kit, right? First, you announce that there's going to be a lockdown, you announce the SOPs. Immediately after, there should be like a plan. Here's how we're going to ramp up vaccinations. And thirdly, is what are the relief that's going to happen? And right now, there is no understanding of relief that's going to happen. So everybody who's a business owner is now thinking, how do I tighten my belt? How do I make sure that I keep my business afloat? Uh, if this goes for two or three months, what do I do? This will mean people may lose their jobs. Uh, if I'm running, uh, that's if I'm running a, a service type business, if I'm running like an F&B outlet, I'm going to probably let go of my, some of my, my, my wait staff or maybe some of my kitchen staff. Uh, if I run a small little garage somewhere, uh, I definitely can't do any work. So obviously people are super nervous because uh, I don't know how I'm going to sustain the next few months because there's no clarity on this. Can businesses survive uh, during this full lockdown uh, based on what we've learned um, during the past uh, more than one year? What will happen to them? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I think Malaysia, I, I, we've said this before, right? I think Malaysian entrepreneurs are very resilient. Mm. Uh, we saw this last year. People really found a way to survive. Some people obviously took hard decisions to cut staff. Some people actually pivoted found new business models using digital technology to do so, and, and they really were able to kind of grow their business. But ultimately, I think the challenge is just the lack of clarity is going to make people make very drastic decisions. Mm -hmm. And because of this lack of clarity, these decisions may not end well for the average consumer or the average uh, Malaysian because ultimately their incomes are going to be dropped. And as a result of incomes dropping, uh, we're going to have a situation where uh, people are not going to spend, which is going to lead to more contraction in the economy moving forward.
Uh, Aaron, based on the assistance uh, provided during the uh, MCO 1.0 and 2.0, what worked and what did not and what do you think should be announced uh, for this full lockdown? So actually, you're right. Last year, we did a lot, uh, which was really great. Like we announced lots and lots of uh, benefits. I've been on this show, we spoke about benefits, not just to SMEs, but to startups. And I think the government last year responded very, very well and very, very quickly announcing many, many different policies, uh, which is why I'm a little bit nervous that this time around, we don't really hear as much or it's not as forthcoming uh, given the, the nature of the announcements. Um, I, I think one thing that really worked last year really well was the loan moratorium. And you mentioned my what I, I tweeted out over the, the weekend. Mm. Uh, if you look at all the banks, they seem to be doing pretty well. So uh, the moratorium itself doesn't seem to have impacted them in a negative way. So ultimately, maybe this is something that we can consider again. Maybe don't do a, last year we did like a six month moratorium plus yep. another six month opt-in. Maybe what we could do is we could do a three month moratorium with a three month opt-in. Ultimately, the thing about these moratoriums is, um, it's not like people aren't going to pay their loans. Mm. It's just that they're going to be allowed to pay it later when the economy stabilizes. So the banks still make their interest, they still get their capital back, and they still can continue business. So I don't see this is a very difficult thing. It also doesn't take any money from the government. Uh, basically, we're just making things a little bit more comfortable for people who have loan facilities, and that's a lot of people out there uh, in different areas. Maybe this could be expanded if there's an ask to like stretch it a bit into other areas of credit which may not be banking related that people may have. Uh, that could be an option as well. Um, another thing I thought was really interesting last year was we had the wage subsidy, and mm -hmm. I noticed in the 2021 budget it was extended, right? Uh, but obviously not at the high ratio it was at the start of the pandemic. Maybe that's, now is the time to increase the wage subsidy again, back up to a thousand ringgit or so for people earning up to a certain amount, like 3,000 ringgit or 4,000 ringgit. I think it'll be really important because people need that comfort. Employers need to know that I don't have to like terminate staff because I can't sustain. Uh, this would be very, very helpful if they could have that. Um, I also think that you know maybe now it's time for a little bit more, uh, like a bit of a more Malaysian spirit. Um, maybe we should start a buy Malaysian campaign, giving benefits to people who use Malaysian vendors, Malaysian SME services, instead of using like foreign services. That could be something we could do just to kind of stimulate the economy and, and give our SMEs a fighting chance to, to f go through this difficult period that's coming up. And, and Aaron, you believe that the economy will recover uh, eventually, right? And, and uh, what you mentioned earlier about the banks, people will eventually be able to pay their loans after this, say, three months period. Uh, three months period. Um, you believe that will happen, right? And, and assistance should be provided on that note, right? Yeah, I think so. Because what we saw, and I, I guess the, the proof is in the reports the banks gave up in Q4 and Q1 uh, of this year, um, is that... The people, there is still demand. People still want to buy stuff. They want to go out. They want to travel. They want to buy that nice handbag. They still want to have a good life, right? Uh, but until such a time where um, there's a little bit more comfort, obviously mm -hmm. travel's not going to happen for a while. Uh, people are going to hold back their purse strings because they don't know how long this is going to last. And that is the biggest issue. It is the um, lack of assurance or lack of visibility of how long this is going to last. That's the problem. And so we got to make sure people can kind of weather the storm, as it were, so that they're in a position to, uh, you know, to spend when the time is right, right? Instead of depleting their savings now, and then when the economy picks up, then there are no more savings and no more, like, discretionary spending they can do because, you know, they've spent it all during the difficult times. Speaking of time, Aaron, I believe the full lockdown will last for about uh, 14 days, and then gradually the government will uh, reduce the intensity over time. And is this a good and clear enough um, bis uh, uh, well, uh, uh, timeline for businesses to plan the activities? Uh, I would say, I mean, I've got two minds on this. Of course, yeah, 14 days is enough. People can hold their nose and, and like, like power through the 14 days. And I think most entrepreneurs, they're resilient enough to do so. It is the uncertainty because we've been here before. I remember when we first announced the lockdown last year in 2020, it was also a two-week lockdown, but then we were in it for months. And so I, I think people also have that memory of what happened the last time in the back of their head. And for this reason, people are very, very nervous. Um, it doesn't also help that we've had several starts and stops in terms of these MCOs over the last couple of weeks, which I think is also causing a lot of um, discomfort with the market because people are very nervous, like, you know, is this for real? Is it going to get worse? Uh, is it going to be 
may longer, people don't really know. And I think that's the biggest problem. Uncertainty around all this is causing the market to get a little bit jittery. And uh, Aaron, we can now uh, look at the list of sectors allowed to operate during the full lockdown. What do you make of these sectors? Well, I mean, I, I think the list seems pretty much reasonable. And I think I, I'll let the experts look at this. Uh, what I will comment on is, you know, I, I think there's a need for people to understand how SMEs operate, right? And so when you see things that, oh, only like 40% of management staff or 30% of management staff can go to office, uh, this doesn't apply to a lot of SMEs because, you know, if you run a 10-man company or a 20-man company, nearly everyone's a manager, right? So how do you make that call? And understanding that not everything operates like a factory, I think is really important mm -hmm. for those in, in power to understand. But I think the sectors, more or less, everybody will have a reason why this is essential. There was a joke going around on my WhatsApp groups about how you know everything's essential uh, because <laughs> everybody obviously wants to stay open. But I think you know I, I think they made a decent decision uh, into like what sectors should open. What is notable, I thought, uh, was that industries like e-commerce now is essential, which I think is really important uh, because I think people have recognised that the e-commerce industry is kind of important to help people tie this last couple of months or the last year at least, um, whether or not you're buying uh, soap powder for the house or food for the house or whether it's um, you're buying, um, you know, getting things delivered from place to place. Um, what's happened with the digital economy, I think is really, really important to help uh, people get through their daily routines. And so I think it's good that the government e-commerce is part of the sectors that should be open. But do you think the um, list of sectors do you think it's enough to address the spread of COVID-19 at these workplaces? Uh, I, think it, I think more or less. I think if these sectors are the ones that are open, it's, it's also okay. Because I, to me, I don't think places of employment are the major cause of a lot of these spreads. Uh, if you look at the data produced by MKN, you'll see the majority of spreads are coming not from places of work per se. I, I mean, of course, restaurants and other places where people congregate are different, right? Uh, but it's a lot of social gatherings, religious events. This is where it happens, where uh, 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 bazaars. This is where the spreads are happening. People are gathering in social situations in tight, uh, confined spaces. Uh, most offices are not structured this way anyway these days. Uh, so I, I don't think the offices for the issue, I think, is the social gatherings. So I think the cutting of social gatherings as a result of the lockdown will actually help bend the curve a bit. Now, Aaron, you're working with a group of startups now uh, to help them to expand their businesses uh, regionally. How are they reacting to this announcement? Uh, and these startups or other startups out there changing their business plans or sectors? So, uh, thanks for asking about this. I think, yes, uh, startups are very close to our heart. At Scale Up Malaysia, we, we back the companies we believe in Malaysia we can go regional and go very far. Last year, I think, uh, I think when we first started doing uh, sessions in Hawaii, um, we invested in 10 companies, and those companies actually had to survive the, the pandemic, as it were. And so some of them actually figured out how to pivot uh, and to find new business models. Some of them found that their business models being digitally delivered actually was something that would uh, grow over the pandemic. But of course, some of the companies who are like in hospitality, who are mm. in travel, those guys are deaf or in mobility, those guys are definitely impacted in a negative way. So some of these guys had to like tighten their belts had to maybe make some hard decisions, let some people go. Um, this was like unavoidable to keep the business running, but uh, entrepreneurs are resilient. Uh, and, but all in all, a quote one companies are doing really well. Um, six out of the 10 companies have raised full-on funding, uh, and some of them has actually come through Malaysian Debt Ventures, who did a program actually recently. So that's really exciting. From quote two, we actually have a demo day coming up with Quest Ventures, uh, where they're going to pitch in front of 50 international investors in a couple of weeks, so we're really excited for them. We're really doing the work to kind of help them get to the next stage, and we think uh, this demo day will actually put them in front of the right people. And then, uh, and also, we're, we're doubling down. We believe that startups are, are the way to go. Uh, let's not forget that Grab uh, is, was a startup that was founded mm -hmm. in Malaysia, and it's arguably the most used technology product uh, in the region because of this pandemic. And so we believe Malaysia can create these amazing startups. And so we're, we're going to do Quad 3 very soon. We partnered with Magic to do it. Uh, and we really believe that uh, the entrepreneurs in our ecosystem can really make some amazing products that can help society in this pandemic and beyond the pandemic. On that note, thank you very much, Aaron, for joining us. Aaron Sarbah, pengasas bersama Scale Up Malaysia, membincangkan berkenaan dengan bantuan dan juga sokongan yang diperlukan startup uh, dan juga PKS, uh, serta orang ramai di luar sana ketika tempoh uh, PKP atau penutupan penuh ekonomi ini. Selepasnya, 
uh, tindakan melantik ahli politik yang tidak kompeten untuk menjadi pengerusi sesebuah syarikat berkaitan kerajaan GLC perlu dihentikan segera. Fellow kanan Majlis Profesor Negara Dr. Jeneri Amir berkata amalan yang telah lama menjadi budaya negara ini adalah tidak sihat dalam pembangunan negara. Tegasnya kerajaan perlu mengambil teladan daripada kontroversi melibatkan ahli Parlimen Pasir Salak, Datuk Seri Tajuddin Abdul Rahman baru-baru ini yang menyebabkan pemecatannya sebagai pengurusi bukan eksekutif Prasarana Malaysia Berhad. Yang pertama ialah harus ada keseimbangan antara latihan politik iaitu ahli politik dengan ahli profesional iaitu khususnya di lembaga pengarah. Tapi ada yang berlaku ialah setengah-setengah pengurusi itu membawa membawa ke dalam ahli lembaga pengarah itu kroni-kroni antara rakan-rakannya. Jadi yang paling penting bagi saya ialah ahli politik itu yang fungsi kat jawatan dalam penting dalam DLC itu harus pertama seorang yang betul ada kelayakan, ada pengalaman kerana dengan adanya pengalaman dan kelayakan yang sesuai maka ini akan dapat memastikan mereka dapat berada di atas undang dan betul. Beliau turut menekankan kenapa ahli politik yang dilantik sebagai pengerusi tidak harus dilantik sebagai eksekutif. Ahli politik yang dilantik sebagai pengerusi tidak harus diberi kuasa eksekutif. Maksudnya mereka harus dilantik sebagai pengerusi bukan eksekutif. Maksudnya mereka tidak boleh campur tangan dalam urusan harian, dalam urusan latihan, kenaikan pangkat, procurement ataupun perolehan tender dan sebagainya. Kalau mereka diberi kuasa on eksekutif yang punya hampir kuasa mutlak dan akhirnya kalau kebetulan ahli ahli lembaga pengarah itu juga adalah rakan-rakan mereka yang juga punya pribadi yang yang sama yang juga penuh dengan otak rasuah telah berkuasa mereka ini sudah itu akan memberi bebanan akan jadi liability kepada DLC yang yang memberi kuasa dan kedudukan mereka uh, di situ. Justru beliau melihat perubahan drastik perlu dilakukan bagi memastikan struktur ekonomi dan hala tuju negara tidak berada di takuk lama. Lepas parah itu, akhir ini agak awal ini teruskan bersama kami di Astro Awal untuk perkembangan dalam dan juga luar negara. Saya Rizal Zulkapli. Salam hormat.